Good evening, everyone. My name is Charlotte Guest. I will be facilitating tonight's discussion. And on behalf of the Geelong Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to tonight's um, library author event. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges the Wadawarrung and Eastern Ma original owners of the lands on which the library services, services operate. We pay respect to Wadawarrung and Eastern Ma original elders, past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations people of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. A couple of housekeeping reminders if you haven't participated in one of the webinars before. You can ask a question via the Q&A pop-up panel um, that is on the bottom of your screen or if you're on an iPad or an iPhone just click the screen and it'll pop up. The webinar is also being recorded, so um, it will be up on the library's YouTube channel in a couple of days time. So a little bit about me before we begin the discussion. I'm a writer and bookseller here in Geelong. I have had some fiction and nonfiction published in journals in Australia, and I'm presently doing my PhD at Deakin University in Geelong as well. Um, now, there were meant to be three of us this evening. Um, Laura McPhee-Brown, uh, due to some unforeseen circumstances, can't join us tonight. So we'll be chatting with Liz and Jack um, for the duration of the hour. And to introduce them, I'll start with Jack Benning, who is a writer from Canberra, Ngunnawal land, um, whose stories have appeared in The Lifted Brow, Hobart, Kill Your Darlings, Overland, and many places elsewhere. He is currently finishing his first book of stories. And Elizabeth Flux is editor at large for the Melbourne City of Literature office and a freelance writer whose fiction and nonfiction work has been widely published. So we're talking this evening about the latest um, Kill Your Darlings New Australian Fiction Anthology, which um, is an anthology of incredible breadth and depth the stories in this uh, collection span many different genres and moods and narratives to create this kind of kaleidoscopic view of the way that we live now. The collection is rich in imagination and experience. It's a dynamic volume of some of the most exciting um, voices in Australian writing today. And I'm super pleased to be chatting with Jack and Elizabeth about their stories. We will be hearing some readings to start off with, and then we'll transition into um, a bit of a conversation after that. So we might go in order of publication, perhaps, in the, in the, um, in the anthology. So Jack, if we could start with you, and then we'll go straight to Liz. Sure, I'd love to. Um, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Always very nice to do an event with Liz as well, who's my uh, good friend and I think work rival, I'd say, at uh, where we work at Cracky. Um, my story is called After the Stampede. And I think I'll just be able to read a couple of pages from it um, before I have to move on. Um, After the Stampede. <clears throat> Wait, sorry. I'm gonna do that um, like short story kind of poetry voice as well when I read it, so please forgive that. I know a lot of people have trouble um, hearing it. I'm alone watching cartoons when the animals come down from the mountain. There must be hundreds of them, a stampede. They churn up our flower beds and shit over the traffic islands. They void the warranty on our tires. They break the tiny penises off the pissing cherub statuettes in our gardens. Goats stick their long tongues through the lettuce, the lettuce slots of our front doors and they frighten our children. Chimps do unspeakable things to one another outside the corner store, all of which is captured on security camera. They seem to want to take everything we have. It is Saturday. It's always disappointing when trouble arrives on a Saturday, a day reserved for selfish virtues. And it's still been early. Everyone is standing at their windows, dumbfounded and afraid. Water birds break against our roofs like hail. My parents have taken my little brother, Kenneth, to his specialists and will be gone for hours. I'm forbidden to leave the house unless in their presence. I never feel more sleepy, I've learned, than, than in the first few minutes of an emergency. As a little boy, I stood before the burning orchestra building, the heat like a hand closing around my face. Some horses kick the side gate off its hinges and get into the backyard to drink 
from my brother's wading pool. The water in the pool hasn't been changed in about two months, so I can't say if drinking it will be good for them. I take some photos through the fly screen in case I need proof to my parents that they don't often believe the things I say, even my most realistic stories, nor do they defend me when the folks from the neighborhood take a swipe or treat me like a thing washed up in a storm. They are popular themselves. All summer long, they make love loudly with the windows open. They call each other disgusting names. The whole street listens to the ritual. Kenneth, too, is considered a gift despite his condition. His body resembles a jigsaw puzzle. Uh, puzzle. He is sweet-eyed and he is warming to speak to. Visitors beam as they watch him quietly read Bible stories to himself. Due to his illnesses, his laughable immune system, his bones, which grew as if in conflict with one another, my parents allow him the pleasure of scattering his toys around the yard and leaving them there to decompose over many thousands of years. I'm not alone in here, I call to the horses. Do you hear me? I have powerful friends and tools at my disposal. I have nothing to interest the likes of you. You can just do your business and leave. The morning is bright. I'm confident the horses can't see me through the fly screen, but all the same, one of them raises up its head and charges right through the nice new patio door. Outside, folks are still counting the dead. They gather at the fountain, rank and murky with the bodies of rodents. Everyone looks wounded and sorry for themselves. A heavy man with a head gash spits on the ground as I ride past him on my bike and a bloody tooth dribbles slowly down his chin. Most of what's left has been trampled, the corpse of a wolf, some woodland things, a few household pets evidently inspired by wild violence of the stampede. A dog wearing one of those anxiety vests, something that seems to be a mule or a skinny horse, and about half a dozen long-legged, mud-coloured wading birds that couldn't keep up. You'd think that I'd been run over by a tank. A group is formed around my neighbour, Jennifer, who is uh, surveying the dismal scene. Her husband, Lloyd, is there with their baby, Margaret. Are you okay? Jennifer asks me. What are you doing here? Where are your parents? There were some horses, I say. They kicked the shit out of my patio. I was lucky to get out alive. A big bobcat got into the kitchen and scratched Lloyd on a hand, says Jennifer. We scared it off with a bar stool. Lloyd's hand has been hastily triaged with a towel. There doesn't seem to be any blood and he can hold Margaret just fine. They're a fine young family. Many think they're wise because they don't own a television. But when they first told me Margaret's name, I thought they were making a joke. This is it, Lloyd says gravely. This is our reckoning. We must think carefully about what we do next. Are you sure it was a bobcat, I ask? What did it look like? You don't think I know what a bobcat looks like, says Lloyd, when it's right in my face, trying to kill me? You're dumber than I thought possible. I gesture for him to pass me Margaret, but he moves her further away. Where are your parents, Jennifer asks again. There are sirens somewhere off from the direction where the animals ran. Everywhere we step, there are pieces of tile or splintered letter posts. Neighbours collect the larger debris and fortify soft points in their hedgerows. They start fires to burn the dead. A team of children push together on the belly of a camel until its eyes bulge out of its skull. If not for the violence, you could mistake it for a street party. I'm on my way to meet them now, I say, wheeling my bike around. They're enjoying lunch nearby. Nobody tells me that it's too dangerous for a child. Nobody thinks of stopping me, though Jennifer does look concerned. Once I called their home and left a message. Leave him, I said, leave Lloyd. There's so, there's so much we both have yet to experience. Bust me out of here. It's time to start our journey. But as far as I know, she never listened to it. She just says, take it easy when you see Kenneth. This might be too much for his little body. I leave them to, com to comfort each other. The younger unsupervised kids chase after me, holding the bones of something small above their heads. Everyone I pass is hugging or whispering or weeping, talking with their heads close together, looking at the dirt or at the clouds, like they're waiting for rain. They stare into each other's eyes, doing the things strangers do when they're alone, the things I'm usually forbidden from seeing. And then he goes on a little adventure. Thanks so much, Jack. Liz, would you like to read your excerpt? Um, yeah, though that's hard to follow, um, but I have some bad news for you, Jack. Um, that was your normal voice, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so my story is called I Go to Pieces, um, which is a pun, which I guess is not surprising for me. 
Uh, I'm just going to read an excerpt from the beginning. Um, I just want to do a quick note about this because I've read a bit of it before and some of my friends pointed out that some of the photos that I describe, which are not going to be in part of this excerpt, are real photos of a real trip I went on to Europe in my early 20s. Um, so I just want to clarify that the protagonist is not me. I did not do this. And even though it is in first person, um, it is fiction. So, yeah. There's a human arm in my luggage. I say this to the woman in the seat next to me. I have a human arm in my luggage. She smiles politely and laughs, though her eyes tell me she doesn't quite understand the joke. Then she pointedly goes back to her book. The man next to her has been sleeping from the moment he sat down, head tilted back, mouth open, and shoulder wedged against the window. He probably has a dead arm too, I think, and I'm pleased at my wit. Technically, it's true. Probably. It's easier for me to think of it as an arm rather than a selection of samples from all across her body. I don't really know how things go from oven to container when they cremate someone. Do they sweep it all up with a special broom? Or is there a sieve that it all falls through afterwards? Is the way the ash settles in the container roughly akin to how the body once was? Head ash, torso ash, leg ash? Or is it all mixed up from the outset? At the funeral, I couldn't stop the stream of questions and pictures squalling through my mind. I stared straight ahead at the ornate coffin with the silver handles and wondered if it would go in the oven too, making wooden body into one, both, both a useless dusty chimera and a waste. Or maybe I'd read somewhere that they would take the body out and place it in a more burn-friendly container. But then what would happen to the coffin? Would it be reused, thrown away, burned somewhere else? I imagined her shoulder-length blonde hair on fire, her face peaceful, untouched. I imagined the dust of her on the bristles of a broom, getting washed away down a sink. Do they hose down the oven afterwards? Or do fragments of strangers mix in perpetuity? Is it not just her I have in this bag? Correction, a third of her. The last time we were in Europe, she and I had been the only women in our group who brought backpacks, and I hated her, just a little bit, for diluting my glory. All the others dragged around ungainly wheelie bags that made our last minute sprints through train stations unbearably slow. We'd arrive at the base of a huge crowded staircase, puffing and wheezing, and inevitably the boys, because although we were all 19, somehow they were boys and we were women, would each grab a handle and heft them all the way up. The owners of the bags would trail behind, awkward and light, while Alicia and I would bring up the rear, stoic, straps digging into our shoulders as we tried to race each other without letting on that that's what we were doing. <clears throat> in photos from that trip, oh no, here are the photos, all right. I looked tense, even in moments when I knew I was having a good time. Everyone else looks relaxed, arms flopped over the backs of chairs, legs kicked out under heavy wooden tables. It creates a sense of belonging. Alicia looks mid-laugh, beautiful in almost every shot. On the train into Venice, I had anxiously counted down the stops, moving closer and closer to the edge of my seat, the nearer we got to our station. Behind me, half our group drank beers from their bags, played snap with an incomplete deck of cards, and told me to chill out when I gave them a two-stop countdown reminder. I watched as Alicia shuffled the deck with an elegant riffle. Five of us made it onto the platform in time to watch the doors close on the rest. As Alicia's mouth formed a muted gasp behind the glass, I thought, you chill out, bitch, even though she hadn't been the one to say it. By the time they caught up to us at the hostel, we had already sussed out the lay of the land, could tell them exactly how much cash they had to pay the receptionist for the unofficial but obligatory city bribe, and had taken all the bottom bunks. Alicia walked into the room we'd booked out, dropped her backpack to the floor, and rubbed her shoulder, wincing as she raised her arm to climb the ladder of the nearest bed. She barely had time to sigh before I said, hey, no, let's swap. And I cleared my stuff off the bed. So the sleeping man had a wheelie bag too. I watched as he struggled to put it in the overhead locker, it's surely too big for the hand luggage limit. He must have got lucky. Or maybe, because he's over six foot tall, the bag looks proportionately small. Ever since I was a child, I haven't been able to look at a wheelie bag without wondering if I'd be able to fit in it. I own three, and I can technically squeeze and contort my body enough to fit inside all of them, but I can only close the lid on one. I reckon I could get three quarters of me into the bag currently in the overhead locker. The best method would be to tuck my head under my left arm, leaving my right leg hanging out. Or, if the walls are strong enough, I could pull my knees to my chest, angle my feet, and just have my head and right shoulder sticking out. When Alicia's mother brought out the urn, I was taken aback by how it was somehow both too big and too small, reduced to ash. I had irrationally been picturing a small triangle of gray dust sitting on the countertop, not a tall beige tube containing a bag. She carefully placed the bag on the stainless steel kitchen scale, put the number into her phone and divided it by three. I'm not great at arithmetic, she said with a small smile. She then carefully scooped out brown spoonfuls of her daughter, keeping an eye on the numbers. Afterwards, we had tea. And as she built a wall around the hole in her life with talk about books and the weather, 
All I could think about was what she would do with that spoon after I left. So stop it there. Mm, thank you. Thanks, both of you. Um, so I'll probably start with the obvious but important question, which is what appeals to you both about the form of short fiction? You work across different modes of storytelling, um, either criticism, reportage or podcasting. So what is special or different about the short story that attracts you both as writers? That's a great question. Liz, do you, <laughs> what do you reckon? I like that it provides opportunities that you can't necessarily find in fiction or in reportage. Everything has its benefits, but in fiction, I guess it can just be, and in the simplest form, weirder. So you can come at conventional ideas from an unconventional angle in order to explore things in a new way that's, I guess, perhaps more honest to you because I guess it, for me, and this is going to sound a bit airy fairy, it's easier to put the shape of your mind on the page than it is in nonfiction. Because mm. with fiction, I think people are willing to give you a little bit of leeway. Whereas in nonfiction, most nonfiction, particularly shorter articles, people have certain expectations of what they're going to get. If it's an article where you're interviewing Ted Pryor about Grug, you should include that. You shouldn't have some sort of surreal element where like, you and also like a ghost you were interviewing like so fiction gives you options that are not available in in other in other writing I think. I, I, I love what you mean by about seems like it's a bit weirder and how you can sort of yeah put the shape of your mind. Uh, the only way I was able to start writing non-fiction I was never able to do it uh, and any time it really started to click with me was when, when I realized that I could approach it in that kind of like from that uh, fictional sort of uh, mode, you know, from that, from a slightly kind of weirder place. And I realized that the boundaries were maybe a little bit less, uh, less strict. And I wouldn't have been able to do that if I hadn't had sort of found this obsession with, um, with short fiction and with kind of story structure uh, in particular. Um, for me, I think I sort of came about to short fiction in a really like roundabout way uh, where I, it was, um, and I feel like a lot of people, like particularly a lot of people who did sort of arts degrees and creative writing degrees, which I very shamefully did, um, that short, short fictions are sort of like, it's a building block for uh, kind of working on larger things, getting into creative nonfiction or for novels. It's really just like a staging ground for ideas more so than it's kind of like a form by itself. Uh, and then, and I kind of got through an entire degree treating it that way where I, was, I would always think, well, uh, you know, the novel is going to be sort of where I go. Um, and it wasn't until I sort of, uh, I think I discovered this kind of like a slew of a sort of primarily, I think, US short story writers, the ones who we sort of breaking free of the very basic kind of like Raymond Carver kind of um, uh, short story path that we kind of, that everyone sort of had hammered into them uh, through uni. And I started to read people like Joy Williams and uh, Dennis Johnson and uh, Bartholomé and Richard Bradigan and people who um, I realised were actually sort of, were treating it completely different to how, how I sort of expected it to. Um, and since then, I didn't really look back. And that was, I don't know, 10 years ago now. So for like better or worse, you know, <laughs> kind of what it's I ended up sticking with. You both mentioned this kind of element of, of weird in, in your stories. And mm. um, I definitely saw a lot of similarities in terms of um, these absurdist impulses or being able to take something um, slightly surrealist and uh, experiment with ideas in a short piece that may be difficult to sustain or maybe not is, you know, what you could discover about a particular idea can, could be done in 4,000 words or a short story format that may not um, be, that may not lend itself to a novel length anyway. So I don't mm. know, do you feel that the short story form lends itself more to experimentation and the weirder and the wilder? Mm. I, I certainly think that, there, at least for my stuff, there's certainly a, a real, there's a, there's a kind of an allure to spending uh, like finite amount of time with a, with an idea with a kind of a particular object this the, this story um, after the stampede um, I think I started writing in about 2015 or 16 in kind of various forms 
and it really felt like it was like okay well this is kind of opening up to this is opening up a larger door somewhere um mm. there, there's always kind of every time i'd go to drafts of it like there's questions about sort of where these animals come from where they go kind of what the story is behind here and but i was never really able to get over that feeling that um i think as soon as if i had to spend more than you know, like, like 3,000 words with this character and kind of in this environment, I think it would really start to like lose its gloss for me um, a little bit. Uh, I remember someone said, I think uh, Donald Antrim in this, in the, he does this amazing um, read on the New Yorker Fiction podcast of Donald Bartholomew's Bought a Little City, which kind of I think was the story that really um, got me like uh, got me in love with short fiction. And he says... Um, he knew that a sort of a good idea can't last forever and particularly like a strange idea can't last forever. And I think there are people who can definitely have shown that's not true. There's, you know, like interminable writers like, um, like Don DeLillo. Don DeLillo can, I think, do wonderful stuff with in kind of a long, larger format with story, with ideas that feel much smaller, but, you know, like he's a genius. Um, whereas I don't, uh, uh, for like a piece like this, I think it's like... Um, I was always so sure that there's a point where you kind of need to end, uh, you need to kind of wrap it up, you know, get out while the party's still good kind of kind of thing. Yeah, Charlotte, I really like your idea of that some ideas burn bright and burn fast, so they absolutely could not sustain a book length work unless mm. um, you're willing to pad it out. Like if you ever feel like you're padding out something, then, then it's not working. Mm. But... Uh, Whenever I approach a story, yes, I always have a question that I'm looking to answer. And some questions are easier to answer quickly and some take a little bit more time. So I guess all of my ideas have been short stories, but sometimes like I will start writing something and I'll realize it's too big and I'll have to stop it. So I guess I don't always know. So like, for example, my question for this one was, what would I do if someone, um, said in their will that I had to take a third of their ashes on a trip around Europe recreating something we did in our late teens. Like that was my question for that. Another story I've written, I was like, what if a cure for mental illness was to have your insides literally replaced with glass? Um, so usually I had to come up with a simple, or simple, a, a straightforward question to a degree. And then my stories are a way of answering that. So some can be answered quickly, some can be answered more slowly. Mm. Do you find yourself doing that every with every story you write? Yeah, there's a question at the core of every really? single one of them okay. because for me that makes it, if otherwise I kind of easy to veer off course and ask why am I writing this? So if I have a definitive thing that I'm trying to achieve, I always can keep it on track. Mm. And when the, within the constraints of a, a certain word limit to define something as a short story, does, this, does the question almost create like a focal point and everything around it sort of um, either is superfluous or, you know, is, is either essential or non-essential to answering that particular question? Mm. Absolutely. You, Charlotte, in your own work, do you, do you find you have a similar approach to that as well? Because that's oh. very... Because the, the question, the, didn't anticipate answering any questions. Yeah, sure. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to know how you sort of um, how you approach that as well with your own stuff. Um, I I did something similar to um, what Liz was just mentioning in terms of a question for a story of um, sort of recently finished writing, which was about if um, Ill, you know the in the in flight in-flight sort of safety cards, if those little people in the in-flight safety cards had consciousness and just mm. had to sit there in these interminable flights and sort of watch these people get in and out of the same seat. Um, and so I, and I felt, um, yeah, that it was certainly guide, it was a process that was guided by trying to answer a single question, but that's the first time that I've actually done that. And I think maybe the story was better as a result than, than mm. some of the previous stories that I've written. So also, that yeah. sounds great. Oh, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was gonna ask you, Jack, about um, mm. the role of animals in, you know, this sort of central symbolism of the animals in yeah. the story. So um, obviously in um, After the Stampede, as we just heard, I heard of herd herd um, of animals came down from the mountain and they flatten parts of the town its inhabitants and, and sometimes each other and at one stage the young protagonist says um, 
well, he wonders why this might have happened. And he says um, the line, I think they know something we don't and they're trying to tell us that or they're getting their own back before it's too late. And it kind of reminded me of a few novels, actually, um, speaking of um, ideas across novels versus short works in Australian writing that also look at human animal relationships, which mm. is Laura Jean McKay's Only the Animals mm. and Chris Flynn's Mammoth. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the animals in your story and actually across your writing, a lot of, I noticed a lot of animals um, and are either in the, the periphery of a story or they're, right. yeah, I noticed a lot of animals, yeah. things, all sorts of things sort of popping up. Can you talk about the animals in your story and what Absolutely. they symbolize? Um, it's, it, it's interesting, like an interesting question because I, I'm sure when I started writing this, like five years ago, there would definitely have been a, um, there definitely would have been an answer to that. Uh, whatever the, um, sort of why, why it has to be sort of animals. It's, it, it turned fairly distinctly, I think, and um, pretty, like, not, not immediately, but sort of over, over the years, it definitely turned into, I guess, like a climate parable, uh, which I sort of, um, wanted to avoid too much. I mean, it's it's completely unavoidable. But in other drafts, it was really just like you know we forced them from their homes and now they're coming for us kind of thing. Uh, not to like downplay, I think that's also, that could be a kind of like a funny idea. But I was just kind of I was handling it uh, just excruciatingly. Um, I've I think I, I love writing about animals because it's um, I didn't really grow up around animals very much. And sort of, I guess, being kind of like an urban dweller for such a long time. Um, the, you know, the only animals you kind of see are pets. And I'm only now getting into a stage of my life where I'm sort of settled enough to like own pets uh, and own kind of cats and cats and dogs. So we're, even, even um, sort of the most basic kind of domesticated animals, whenever they appeared in my story, it was always, uh, sorry, they're usually kind of doing something weird or they're, it's a bit mm. aberrant like in, in one of my stories where there, a guy is trying to, um, he gets in touch with the service that sort of rehomes kind of psychotic uh, dogs from like, um, like dogs with PTSD or something like that. And it ends up completely um, backfiring on him. Um, I think there's, there's another aspect of it, which is uh, I've always kind of had this, um, uh, kind of a version, I guess, to kind of like Australiana, uh, at least kind of in my early writing, and that was particularly because of um, who I was, who I was writing, who I was most kind of, who I was reading and was most influenced by. Uh, and it only really occurred to me when I was rereading the story once it had already been published that the there's kind of very few, maybe not no sort of Australian kind of cultural touchstones in the form of animals, which, um, for you know, in a country that has they kind of bases so much of our identity around this kind of like fetishization of the kind of danger of animals and the danger of, of Australian nature itself um, feels, it, it sort of, it's, it seems surprising to me. Like I thought, well, why, what was my thinking there? Why didn't I kind of want to go down that avenue? Cause I've definitely changed. Um, I like to incorporate more kind of Australian things sort of, I still don't do it very successfully. Um, and so every animal that kind of that features in it is either a very kind of Eurocentric animal or a domesticated animal of some kind. And I think when I had this vision of it, it was as it was either like it was a circus or it was a Hollywood, um, like a Hollywood soundstage where everything had just sort of like burst, uh, burst through or uh, like a, a laboratory or something like that, where all these, you know, uh, whenever they're like those, baboons escape from from labs in like Sydney there's this um sense in a number of your stories where there's kind of like this pendulum effect where something either begins tame or this idea of sort of tame or safe mm. or, or approachable and just sort of becomes <laughs> monstrous like yeah. the um in a couple of the short pieces for small town grievances <laughs> mm, <sorry>. how, um, <laughs> how in yeah there's a few pieces in um, small town grievances which we'll talk about a bit later mm. where um, there are some comfort dogs introduced I think to a uh, to a retirement home or yes something, and they just turn yeah. immediately monstrous and they have yeah. to be sort of evacuated from the premises yeah in the kind of the, the loudest and messiest way possible is what he describes <laughs> it or something like that um 
Yeah, that is. Uh, I think I'm. I'm. I don't feel. I don't, I don't feel uneasy around animals. In fact, I feel kind of very. Uh, I feel very kind of affectionate towards them. But for some reason, there's always something in the back of my mind. I'm. I'm house sitting at the moment, and, and I think you might have seen the cat that just came past. Um, there's like oh, something might go wrong at this sort of at any moment. You know, having to like chase after a dog because it doesn't know you yet and won't um, won't listen to you, kind of trying to stop it, or just you know because it's. Um, because it's going off. Uh, I um, one stage was helping to um, dog sit for sort of strangers' dogs, and it was always this very kind of everything was always bordering on chaos. You know, like it was it would have taken so little for like the veil just to drop, and you know society to kind of collapse, like in those in those instances. So I guess this is kind of this story is definitely feeding off that kind of that that feeling of um, anxiety. I think I get around. They did that in, animals, um, that something's going to go wrong. Yeah. The, well, in both your stories and, and particularly um, you, Liz, there's um, this real uh, sense of the humour that is a part of banal kind of mundane things or things that have a banality about them, even though they might be extraordinary, such as the scenario of taking a friend's ashes um, to Europe to, you know, disperse them respectfully or however that may be um, and I wondered if you could talk about the um, this light and dark in your stories and the sense of humor that you create in your in your style which is kind of like um, you know the the thinking through of something until the questions that are being asked sound quite strange or quite bizarre but they're, they're legitimate, they're questions that you think, oh, hang on, yeah, what does happen to the coffin? You know, can you talk about your sense of humour in that is carried across in a number of your pieces? Um, so I guess a lot of my pieces use humour, and I guess absur absurd humour, if I have to put a label on it. And I guess it's because generally I'm my primary audience, like my first audience member is always me. Like I always write something that I would want to read. And I'm always glad when someone else also likes it. I always never expect that anyone but me is going to like my work. And I can never be all sad or all funny at the same time. So I like to mish, mash them together. And I guess kind of because it's like that in, in normal life, like everything is absurd if you think about it too deeply, like words, mm. scenarios, shaking hands, mm. like any anything if you think about it for too long or if you try and describe it in a, different way starts to become silly so um I like to push the boundary of that in my work so I, as I mentioned there's the the one about curing mental illness by replacing your insides with glass like that absolutely would not work and there's no reason that that would be helpful in any way but it's also I guess a way to look at a serious issue with an edge of humor because I find that more accessible as a reader because if we want to read something like literal short fiction can be great and I enjoy reading it I just don't enjoy writing it mm. and I think that fiction gives us an opportunity to look at things differently and I think humor is a good way in for a lot of people because otherwise a story can seem too grim too earnest and you don't take on board the messages it's kind of like hiding vegetables in a soup so yeah <laughs> um there's a talking about a couple of themes so um we're saying you know obviously reoccurring themes of or symbols of, of animals in in jack's writing that um i noticed in in your um across a number of your stories i noticed the theme of transformation um coming up a lot so you mentioned the story where um you you know the idea of curing mental illness by having insights you know um, replaced by glass in um another one of your stories um the protagonist uh, a female protagonist slowly transforms into a mop um as her partner does less and less uh domestic you know housework um, and there's a few others where the main character or one of the main characters will turn into physically something else. And so um, I wondered about how this physicality or these ideas of transformations allow you to explore more intangible ideas in your fiction. So like 
labor or um, how we process grief or, or ideas of obsession. So how does that, how does that work in your fiction? I guess because we're all living our internal lives all the time, we know how we feel, but I like to make it physical, make it real so that people can literally see what is happening to someone. So there's another story I wrote about, it's called, I think I always forget what it's called, if it's called One's Company or Two's Company, but it's about a boy who moves from overseas and he starts to divide into two separate people from the moment he gets off the plane and everyone around him just sort of goes, Ugh, that's that's very annoying and inconvenient. We're gonna have to buy you more clothes. Can you just like pull yourself together, kind of thing? And that was my way of putting, I guess, into different words the feeling of having a cultural split. Like as someone who's moved over from another country, there is pressure to fit in and subvert, like suppress parts of yourself. Like I remember coming to school and people would laugh when I didn't know certain Australian terms or that kind of thing and so but to to write that as a story where someone just goes to school and feels sad because people are kind of mean because they came from another country to I'm not that kind of writer I don't think I could make a compelling story from feelings alone so for me to put it in a physical sense you can see it happening and maybe that will drive people who haven't felt those things to see it in a different way and maybe then be able to work back to the actual issue so I know you mentioned in a interview with the morning bell podcast um that you have a degree or a background in um or medical degree and is there sort of a correlation between interest in the body and fictionalizing the body and um you know things that are situated uh physically in the self with with your background in um medicine I think so like I'm it means that for one thing it means that I have a great circle of people that I can send a message to and be like hey um if you wanted to kill someone but not leave any trace in their body of how to do that what would I do and then you get like five people will send you five different responses and not ask you why you're asking them <laughs> which I think is great as a writer hopefully they know that that's why I'm asking them these things so that's one benefit of it the other is, yeah, it helps you, the anatomy of it all. I guess I'm, I was always interested in anatomy and you can always like, Ocarina, the one about the glass, like though that's not physically possible, I made it as accurate as you could if it were feasible. And mm. I think that feeds into it. And the final thing that I think medical school, which I didn't finish, I did two thirds of it. So I have a health science degree. Um, what it helped me with is it gave me a lot of, access to people that I wouldn't normally have had which was a great privilege like you got to go and experience some of the worst and the best times of people's lives that even their family sometimes don't get to see people confide in you they share things with you um, which I never include in my stories because those are real people who are out there still living their lives but it gives you an insight into how other people's minds work and how other people's experiences are um, and shows you how much of a world there is beyond yourself. And for me, that was invaluable. Um, and also part of the reason why I left, because uh, I take on a bit too much, I think, of other people's stories and feelings. Mm. So, yeah, it was a good, it was a privilege, but it's also hefty. So it's good that we have people who can do it. Um, Jack, we mentioned um, just previously about one of your other projects, which is called Small Town Grievances. Mm. Um, and you describe it on your website as something you started in 2018 as a lifeline for your writing. I wondered if you could explain a bit firstly about what the Small Town Grievances project is and how, it, how did it sustain or revive your writing? Um, Small Town Grievances, I'm so glad you read that, that you read it because you brought it up in, a, in an earlier email. Um, uh, I'm really glad, I'm always very glad when people find that because it was a, uh, first of all, firstly, it's a, um, it's a newsletter, just a tiny letter, which was originally a sort of weekly or fortnightly, uh, uh, sort of missive that I would send out, uh, in a fictional voice or voices, uh, which are meant to be, uh, which is written in the form of a, of a kind of a bulletin and newsletter of, of like goings on in a small town, but it's always like the disappointing things of a small town. Um, 
with a sort of very mercurial and like unnamed mayor. No one is really particularly named. Uh, there are there are very little there are very little sort of rules to it. There's no um, uh, there isn't much of a sort of guiding. Uh, like there's not much of a through line towards it, except it does have an internal logic of some kind, but basically it's like wacky town where bad stuff happens. Um, so I started writing this. Um, it's kind of the, I guess the purest form of the kind of writing I want to do and that I like to do. And it's also had probably the biggest effect on people and on, on readers. Uh, and sort of, you know, initially when I started sending it out, it was to 20 or 30 people and it's just kind of like ballooned um, up to, to about a thousand now and, um, and people can still you're you're still right you people can go and sign up yes for your word. yes yeah. 100%. it's still an it's still, ongoing it's, it's thing. still an ongoing yeah. thing though mainly it's now kind of three monthly if at, sort of at that um so back in 2018 uh which wasn't a very good year for me when i was kind of underemployed uh had a crappy kind of house situation um and kept on getting rejected uh, i've been in this cycle of and um i'd, I'd be Definitely curious to, to find out Liz's, uh, sorry, Liz's um, sort of thoughts on, on this or if she's experienced this, uh, this cycle of just applying for the kind of maybe like five or six uh, big Australian short story prizes. Um, the, back then there was, there's, there's a couple that's kind of collapsed now, but, you know, the Josephine Ulrich and the um, Elizabeth Jolly and the VU Overland Prize and kind of things of that nature. Um, and sort of without fail, I was just getting knocked back, uh, knocked back constantly for them. And I'd spend sort of months and months because it wasn't working enough. So I just keep on working on these stories that I didn't really like reading very much. And I'd always kind of read them over a couple months afterwards and think like, why did you spend all this time on this? There's maybe something interesting there, but it's not the kind of writing I like to do. And this isn't to say that um, the writing that those uh, prizes um, sort of, that they accept and that they, uh, and that they will, um, I guess, lionize is not like uh, there's nothing wrong with that kind of style of writing, but it's a style that's so that I, that I do so elegantly and so unskillfully that it was kind of just like, you know, one of those um, athletes trying to train for the Olympics, but has like no background whatsoever in the kind of sport that they're doing. Um, and I realized that I've been doing that for sort of about maybe like three years or more, um, probably since I graduated. Uh, from my degree because uh, I thought that was kind of like how um, I was going to sort of proceed as a short story writer and that I, if I kind of kept trying uh, that I would reach this point so I was in 2018 nothing was really working and I was like I'm just gonna start putting my ideas out in a newsletter um, every week it's just gonna be dumb little ideas there's no rules if someone signs up for it you know no matter what like it's fine it doesn't sort of who gives a shit uh, and my friends will read it and that's fine uh, and since then um, I realized that all my good writing was going in there. I burnt through kind of several thousand words in the first, in the first news, uh, the first sort of three newsletters or so. Um, it was this kind of like small, like revolt, I guess, in how I sort of approach work and how I approach uh, writing and um, what I find satisfying in writing. And I think that was, I'm like, I'm not the smartest man in the world. And so I think things often take a long time to, uh, that, that are probably obvious to everyone else. Um, but it was the first time I realized that uh, I guess to create art, it isn't about sort of being successful by any metric. It's about um, kind of finding what you love and sort of just pursuing that as like doggedly as possible. And it was sort of the first time I realized like, okay, I found what I love to do in, um, in short fiction. Um, and I've since sort of published a few stories based off concepts or just based off even kind of single lines that have, um, that I've written, that I wrote in, in small town grievances. The issue with it, so much of it I think is unpublishable. Like so much of it is it's sort of very strange, a little bit kind of esoteric. It would need a lot of work to, to um, kind of compose it into, into a single narrative or into even kind of split narratives. And that goes a little bit against what I, I think what, like, I guess what the, you know, philosophy behind it was, which is that um, it's going to be as sort of ramshackle as possible. But um, as long as it's kind of funny, a little bit morose, um, I think it's going to be able to kind of go on indefinitely like that, hopefully. I think it's up to about sort of 30 or 40 or something now. The, um, um, the, they are extreme, like they're extremely funny and they're also very dark, um, which is what mm. we're, you know, talking about before is um, 
maybe some commonalities between if, um, your styles of writing. Mm. Uh, but they reminded me, um, like you said, it's in the it's in the form of like a, a short bulletin. But um, uh, we, my partner and I, spent some time between Australia and the US, and he comes from a very small um, town in the US, and they have something called the Sheriff's Calls. And um, I, we emailed briefly about this, Jack, um, because mm. I wondered if th th these were perhaps the inspiration for um, any of the small town grievance ideas. So to give, just in case anyone's not um, totally familiar with what a sheriff's call is or you know, a small town grievance, because they share kind of commonalities. This, so they're published in, in the paper um, as almost like a log of all the calls that come to the sheriff's office. And they kind of write them out at these almost like mini kind of noir like vignettes. And they're, they're ex these are real in the, in the um, newspaper, but they're super bizarre. Mm. One example, which is... Um, I was, hoping you, I was hoping you were going to read it. I was just okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, as long as you're happy for me to yeah, read please, so this, please do. This is, the, this is one of the real examples from the town where um, my partner's from. Uh, it was in the paper a little while ago. It says, at 3.01 p.m., a man found a small package at his gate wrapped in butcher paper and rubber, rubber bands labelled with the word proof. A deputy opened it, finding some sort of artefact that had owls on one side. The man said he'd seen such owls before, took the package inside and requested no further action. Uh, it's, just, it's, a, like, it's delicious, isn't it? It's, so, it's amazing. I'm yeah. Like, Should have planned I wonder, is this Jack's newsletter or is this the real one? Yeah, yeah, yeah almost, you know, I almost thought of doing that and I thought, no, that would take like up the whole yeah. hour. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love what the, just so I, I won't get bogged down too much about small time grievances, but what I love about that and what I try to kind of capture in, uh, in my newsletter is the, the kind of the authorial intent there is like, you know, it's, it's completely like inscrutable. It's sort of, they, they might think they're being kind of as clear as possible, but really, no, they're talking about, you know, an object with rubber bands. There's some kind of artifact inside. And it's like, yep, yeah, publish it. That's fine. People are yeah, going to get that. It's like, what are you yeah. talking about? It's fantastic. And it kind of, it speaks to this, I guess, this, um, I guess the idea of like naturally occurring narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question um, from one of the viewers, Jacqueline, who asks if the stories that you tend to write or want to write differ quite a lot from the ones that you like to read. So, Liz, you were talking about how um, you might really enjoy um, reading some real, more realist um, short stories, but find that you can't write them. Um, it, can you elaborate a bit on that in terms of is there much of a difference between what you like to read versus what you like to write? It's an interesting one because because of my line of work, I don't often, I don't always have a huge amount of say in what it is I'm reading because I do a lot of reading for work. So it's um, so it's not entirely autonomous. Um, but I, I guess I do in uh, every. Well, I have a Terry Pratchett podcast, which means that every month I read a Terry Pratchett book. So that's quite different to what I write. I read a lot of nonfiction. I do find that if I'm writing a short story, I don't want to read anything very similar to what I'm doing. And at the end of last year, I had an experience where I finished writing a short story that hasn't been published yet. Um, and a lot of it <clears throat> centers on rose gardens and this neighborly dispute over flowers. And I finished it. I put it aside. I was like, okay, I'll leave that a bit. And then I was like, I'm going to read Shirley Jackson for the first time. And I like opened up a collection of her short stories. And the first one was about a woman who's obsessed with her her flowers and I was like oh no I put it away <laughs> and I haven't touched it since because I was like oh what if it like bleeds across into my work even though I absolutely love her stuff like as in I've read some of her longer works but her short stories I hadn't and it really freaked me out so um yeah that was Jack oh sorry Can no, that, that was it yeah that was what I was gonna say um Jack what, I mean, does that um resonate with you in terms of differences with reading writing style I think I, I largely yes like I tend to um I'll seek out all the kind of writing that I uh the kind of writing that I like to do myself mainly because nothing sort of triggers what I do better um I'm not uh I'm not nearly as widely read as I want to be and I'm definitely not I'm, a, I'm ex an extraordinarily slow reader um so I kind of need to I think kind of like I've got to hit those KPIs, you know, I've got to hit the, I've got to read the stories 
uh, enough stories at a kind of at a good enough pace um, that I know that it's going to be like fueling kind of my own ideas. Um, the um, I guess like but on, on the fringes of that, and I've certainly my reading habits have certainly changed uh, even in the kind of last I guess even last year during lockdown when I was drawn to much longer things, I was drawn to much more kind of escapist stuff. Um, I would be reading. Uh, uh, I'd be reading sort of like his, historical novels and the kind of larger works and things like that. But there's always a, I think there's always a criteria that it has to kind of fit. It's either got to be like lyrical, but not overly so. Um, and it's usually got to be funny. And so there's a few writers who I really admire, um, particularly uh, uh, who, who kind of fall there, for the sort of, I guess, within that somewhere, like it, it's not really much like what I do but I'll sort of seek out everything that I can of theirs. Um, I, I guess on one side, there's um, uh, Josephine Rowe and kind of her short fiction who, you know, I don't think anyone in Australia or elsewhere sort of can, can do what she does uh, in terms of, um, uh, in terms of just kind of, I guess, these, these um, like portraits she can create. Uh, and someone who is sort of writes in this way that I wish I could is um, Paul De La Rosa, a, um, uh, who's an Australian, sort of a young Australian writer who's um, sort of blowing up, has been blowing up for the last kind of couple of years. Uh, and something about his work is that is it, though kind of, it takes a much more kind of, um, I guess, realist bent, though sort of goes in strange directions. Um, it's so sort of unexpectedly funny it'll just, and it will just come out of nowhere. And I, I think um, even though those two authors sort of a pretty far away from the kind of stuff I like to write myself, um, there's just something like magical that happens. I think when you read those, when you read their work, um, sort of unlike any other, I guess, like certainly Australian and probably like any other kind of writer. Liz, you mentioned um, that a lot of your reading is dictated by um, what you have to read for work um, and doing your doing editing for the Melbourne City of Literature, and um, I believe you've done done sort of general um, editing and freelance work as well. And I'm wondering if you've ever sort of learned something about the craft of short fiction um, from your editing work that you've then applied across to your writing work. Has something kind of originated in how you've approached something as an editor that you thought, oh, hang on. Okay, I can apply that in my writing. I think a lot of the lessons come subconsciously because you, when I was editing voice works, I'd read like, hundreds of short stories every quarter, um, unedited, un like unpolished of varying qualities because which is normal when you're doing the gatekeeping for um, a publication. Gatekeeping makes it sound so awful, but like people would share work at different stages and it allowed me to see how different people shape. Like, and after you chose some, you'd see how a story would change from their first draft to the, the final draft. So. I don't think I picked up any overt lessons other than it really sucks when people name drop the books that their characters are reading for no good reason in in their story because that was a thing that I saw quite often and you'd be like ah you want me to know that you've read these books for what reason but so I mean that's a bit of a specific answer but I think there's a lot of subconscious lessons you can learn about pacing about how much you can trust your reader because sometimes mm. you can really feel it as a reader if you're over explaining a plot point and I think as a writer especially someone who does a lot of nonfiction as well I have a drive to make sure that what I'm saying is clear like make sure you understand what it is I'm saying and in fiction it's not great to hammer something home too much you have to trust your reader and you have to allow for ambiguity so I think that's perhaps the biggest lesson I've taken away from editing. Mm. Um, speaking of books, I've got, there's a question here from the audience um, for Jack, just to repeat, so because you were uh, um, recommending a few of your favourite short story writers and it's something I want to ask both of you about who mm. you would recommend reading. So we might start with Jack because of the question from the audience. Who were some of those writers and, and their collections that you mentioned before? Sure. Um, the, the ones who sort of, I think, really planted that, um, like that seed in my mind that this, could, that this is a form which you can kind of do something with that you can't really do elsewhere. Uh, probably the biggest one would be Joy Williams, um, who's a kind of venerated uh, US kind of short story, extremely pro prolific short story writer uh, who writes, we'll, we'll just kind of write the most striking and just 
sort of vaguely strangest uh, pieces, like unlike anything I've sort of read elsewhere. Uh, and who I've seen described, I heard her described on one podcast as, uh, uh, by a writer as, um, she's a writer that you can't learn anything from. You know, she can't, you can't Ouch. teach, as in, or because there's like, <laughs> because there's so much going on that it's kind of folly to try to like teach that, you know? And I really kind of felt that. And I, I've spent the last two years trying to write like Joy Williams stories just for like, and I uh, didn't get anywhere. Um, Dennis Johnson had his, um, uh, his kind of big book, Jesus Son was a huge, uh, influence, you know, 27,000 words, something like that. Kind of you, you finish it in the afternoon, or like most people could, I can't. Um, just like kind of quick as a whip, strange and poetic. Uh, and I guess the third one would be um, uh, uh, Barthelme, Donald Barthelme. Uh, again, very prolific. Uh, his work, his stuff, uh, he's very often very absurdist. His stories that that kind of tilt a little bit more at realism or at least kind of use the building blocks of realism, um, I think are sort of unmatched. But unfortunately, he also writes, um, he's written dozens and dozens and dozens of books, uh, stories in his life. Um, and I just don't have the mind to sort of put some of that, put some of that together, but it's an extraordinarily useful sort of tool just for like putting your brain into a certain kind of uh, like factory settings mode, you know? When Liz, you read who would you, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, no, that's it. <laughs> I was just going to say, Liz, who would you recommend people um, go and seek out if they want to delve more into short stories? Um, so in Australia, there's like, Elizabeth Tan does some really great work and she's put out a book last year called Smart Ovens for Lonely People, which is great. Um, Laura Elvery is also really great. She has a, a short story collection out last year as well. Um, Paul mm. De La Rosa, as Jack mentioned, is amazing. Uh, he has short stories here and there in different places. He's got some, one in Mianjin, there's one in Granta that I still think about quite regularly. So I think if you can seek out some of his short stories, um, some of which were in voice works, um, which I was privileged enough to edit as well. Um, I also really enjoy Otessa Moshfeg's short story collection, um, I forgot Homesick for Another World. That's a really interesting one because she has the ability to change between they, they're all unlikable, her protagonists, but they're also different from one another. And I noticed she switches from first person to third person with a ridiculous ease, which not everyone can do. Um, and as a sort of wildcard one, I quite enjoy going back to Philip K. Dick short stories every so often because they are so variable. So sometimes like he's clearly someone whose mind is working so fast that he cannot, his, his hand can't keep up with the writing. And sometimes you can, you can see the idea spilling out the edges of a piece of work that is not of the quality it should be. But fortunately and unfortunately, he was living in an era where you got paid very handsomely per word for a short story. So I suspect he would just smash one out, get paid. And because he had nonstop ideas, um, that didn't really matter if he didn't get it quite up to scratch. So he's prolific. And I also find it really interesting exercise as a writer to read the work of someone who's so widely published, so well known, who has work out there that is great and also work out there that's not so great. And you can kind of see his process in different ways. And that's interesting from a technical point of view. Mm. We are actually nearly out of time. Um, so thank you so much both for discussing your work in particular and short stories and short fiction in general. It's been a pleasure. Um, I wanted to obviously remind everyone that they can pick up a copy of uh, the new Australian fiction anthology from the Bookbird in Geelong West. If you're in Geelong, obviously you can borrow copies from the library as well. Um, and on behalf of the library, that's pretty much it. So thanks so much for joining me. And um, there are more information on the next a lot of library events on the website as well. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks so much, Charlotte. That was wonderful. Awesome. Great. Bye. Cheers. Bye. <laughs>